Every day, you and I get bombarded with negative news. Just like the body becomes what we eat, the mind becomes what we're putting in. It is important to listen to stories that not only gives you hope, but also inspires you and uplifts you. In this podcast, we're interviewing experts who will break down the solutions to the world's most pressing problems. And I promise you, if you listen to this podcast, you will not only stay informed, but you will also feel more energy in your life. Welcome to Great.com Talks with... Great.com is a philanthropic project where we're donating 100% of our profit towards the most effective cause there is, uh, like protecting the rainforest, funding climate change technology. And the best thing that you can do to help support that mission would be to subscribe to the channel. Today, I want to introduce this topic in reading a one-minute story that kind of broke my heart when I read it. So imagine being the mother to an HIV baby. Uh, The baby's name is Rose. And you go to the nearest clinic, which is two hours away, to purchase medicine for your daughter. And after a long walk, you arrive and find out that there are no medications for a nine-month-old baby. And the only medication available is formula for adults. Um, And you kind of struggle to comprehend that there is nothing you can do for your daughter because there's no medicine to treat the infection that keeps assailing her body. Um, But then a doctor explained that even though there is no pediatric formula available for your daughter, they will give you some adult medicine, which you will have to cut and then crush. Um, And how much you give to the baby depends on her weight. Um, So you have to be very careful, very, very careful to not give her too little, because then she might develop a resistance to the medicine and not too much because that could kill her. Uh, You have to come to the clinic often to monitor your daughter's weight so that you can know how much medicine to actually give her. Um, And you kind of feel terrified, uh, but it's the only way to give her a chance of living. Uh, The topic of today is AIDS and hope. How valuable is hope for someone who has gotten affected by HIV? And to understand more about this, we have invited Tanya Weaver from AFCA, American Foundation for Children with AIDS. So I want to say, Tanya, welcome to this interview. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Tanya, if I understand correct, you've been with the organization almost since it began in 2005. Yes. Yep. And I guess this story that I just read uh, is from the beginning when you guys started this. Um, So help us understand how many parents struggle today to get uh, medicine, HIV medicine, or other kind of medicine supplies for their children right now? Yeah, so the difference between 2005 and today is extraordinary. So while we were losing children at 97% back then, now it has reversed because there's so many organizations and governments that are actually helping out. And we do have pediatric formulas now. No longer do doctors have to guess at what to give a child. Um, There's liquids now. There's some medicine that can be stored in regular temperature, no refrigeration needed. And all these things have really made it so much better for children and for their guardians. Um, Yet still, there is a huge gap of children receiving the medicine that they need. And the in the days of COVID, it's even worse because now a lot of resources are going to other things. So we are reverting back to 2008 um, levels of HIV, unfortunately. And that means that a lot of more kids are going to need medicine. So the story of AFCA, American Foundation for Children um, with AIDS, started with uh, helping parents and children uh, with the medicine. Um, what would you say right now that uh, the problem that you're trying to solve, how would you describe uh, the mission or the, the problem? So you're absolutely right that that's how we started, but we realized very quickly that we don't want to become a welfare system. We actually want people to be able to buy their own medicine, to feed themselves, to educate themselves. And to do that, we have started creating self-sustaining projects. So our goal is to get these children a more rounded care where um, they receive 
the training that they need, the help that they need, the output that they need, whether it's livestock or gardens, whether it's um, education, um, anything that they might need so that they can move forward and take care of themselves. So we're tackling it more of a holistic way as opposed to just giving medicine. I heard someone say the term graduating from poverty. Uh, you help someone um, learn how to not be in that position. So that's kind of what I'm hearing that you guys are doing with the sustainable project. I love that. Yes. And we don't only graduate people from poverty, but then we ask them to help another family in their situation do the same. So in our livestock and garden project, the beneficiary becomes the giver later on. So it's a cycle thing so that they actually become a blessing to somebody else. I love that term. Yeah. It says a lot, that term. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so right now, a lot of focus goes into sustainability kind of projects. And you mentioned some of those, uh, educating uh, livestock, uh, gardening. Um, could you help us explain more? Um, what could a project look like in more specific details? So. Sure. Um, we have two basic projects, two basic goals. One will be for orphanages and clinics. So we help them become self-sustaining either through greenhouse projects or farming projects. Um, we do bring in medical equipment and supplies to a hospital. But then what happens later on when they start running out of supplies? So they have to have a way to be able to purchase again. Uh, we have orphanages where um, we have, it's so exciting, in Zimbabwe, there's a, a home for, for girls. Most of them were raped. Uh, they come in very young. Um, most of them are HIV positive. They live in this beautiful home where their children are raised with them and where they are given hope. And we have been putting up greenhouses, very large greenhouses. And we also help them with tailoring, shop, with um, haircutting with cooking classes and everything that is involved in that. And now in Zimbabwe, in a country with 97% unemployment, where hunger is rampant, they are actually food secure, 100% food secure. And they are now selling out of the greenhouses. So we've done our job. There's these girls that are trained, that are learning how to work. They're getting an education. Their children are being raised. and the whole place is secure, including the staff. So, and then on the, on the flip side, we also help families. So let's say in Congo, we have a program where we give livestock training, seeds, solar lamps, and water filters to families that are raising AIDS orphans. And um, just in my last visit, it was so exciting to, to meet with all these families and see how their children are actually back in school you can tell the ones that are part of our program because they no longer have the distended bellies. They are no longer full of rashes or with the orange hair that goes with um, just being starved. But instead, they're back in school and they're eating well and they're selling their animals and they're building their homes. So they graduated from poverty. I'm going to use that from now on. And, and then they turn around and they help another family. So um, th that's a type of sustainable programs we do, both for the individual family and for institutions. That really helps to understand. Um, and are you saying um, this model that you found, uh, is that something that you're looking to scale to do create in other places as well? Or would this be, um, yeah, would, would that be able to scale? We would love to scale. Yes, absolutely. So right now in Congo, we have the plans of building another multiplication center for animals, which becomes a training center as well for people. And we have just added another orphanage to our list in Zimbabwe. And I just sent the money for a new greenhouse there. Um, we also just started a piggery in Kenya. So yes, we are wanting to scale up. Um, we are a tiny organization, one and a half full-time people. Um, so it takes time, but that our goal is to help more kids, yes. Uh, help us um, understand uh, the role that hope plays in the work that you see and do. Uh, how important is hope? I don't think we could do what we do without hope. 
either from our side as staff, nor on the side of the recipient, nor on the side of the local people who are working. I think that without hope, we couldn't move forward. Um, a little story, way back when I started, I interviewed six children in Mombasa, Kenya, and I asked them what did they want to be when they grew up. And they all looked at me blankly. They had no idea that they could grow up because they've seen their parents die and they knew they had the same virus. And they just looked at me, they stared at me and they did not know what to answer. Six years later, I interviewed them again and I said, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And they, it was amazing. They're jumping up and down and they're like, a doctor, I wanna be a nurse. I wanna be a taxi driver. I wanna be a pilot because they had hope. So it wasn't really because they were taking medicine that they were able to say that. It's because they now had hope that they were going to make it to adulthood and that they were going to have a full life. So hope plays an incredible part in everything. You can take medicine, but if you don't have that desire, that knowledge, that hope that you can move forward, it's not going to really do you much good. You're not going to take it as well. You're not going to be as consistent. You're not going to work as hard. But when you know that there is light at the end of the tunnel and that somebody cares, it makes all the difference for sure. Um, help us um, to understand, is there, is there anything that you would like people to do after hearing this into you? Any kind of support that you are looking for or anything that you just want people to be aware of? There would be a couple things. Um, the first would obviously be to learn more about what we do and be a part of it. You can do that by joining one of our volunteer teams and going to Africa with me and working on one of the projects. Or if you're an outdoor type person, you could go on one of our adventure treks and fundraise by going up Kilimanjaro or going to New Zealand. We have all the information on our website, but also you could donate. You could um, donate knowing that a full 94% of anything that we receive goes straight out to the children. We do our best to keep our overhead low. Um, we're very transparent in how we manage our, our, our money. And we just need to, unfortunately, we need more money to be able to scale up and to do more. So I would invite anybody to do any or all of those three things. And if you want to go to the website, uh... Uh, what would be the website uh, address? It would be A-F-C-A-I-D-S dot O-R-G. So A-F-C-A-I-D-S dot O-R-G. Um, we're going towards the end here. Is there anything uh, extra importance that you would like to bring up here uh, for people to understand when they think about the AFCA um, or anything, a message that you want to highlight? Don't forget our kids. There's a lot, a lot right now happening. There's COVID, there's wars, there's politics. There's so much happening in our world, but AIDS still exists. Um, children who've been orphaned by AIDS still exist. So please don't forget about those kids. They, um, they're beautiful they, and they need us. So just spread the word about what we do and come be a part of it. Tanya, thank you very much for taking the time uh, clarifying um, the work that you do and uh, the, the need that these children have. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.